Aloha, brothers and sisters. I am happy to be here to introduce Eric. He is a wonderful husband and father, and I don't know anyone with a better heart or with better intentions. I am grateful to be married to such a good man. So here's a little bit about him. Eric John Keave Marlowe was born here in Laie while his father taught at BYU Hawaii, then the Church College of Hawaii. One of nine children, his family moved to Florida, California, Japan, back to California, and eventually settled in Rexburg, Idaho. He served a mission in Honduras, attended Ricks College, now BYU-Idaho, Utah State University, and Brigham Young University. We met in Salt Lake while Eric was teaching Release Time Seminary. I knew I was in for an adventurous life when he surprised me by flying us to San Francisco in the morning so that after a day of sightseeing, he could propose to me on Treasure Island while we watched the sun set over San Francisco, all in time to catch a return flight home that night. He's also the instigator of the fun in our family. He loves to try new things, such as exotic food, and he loves to visit new places. As a student, he studied in Israel and Mexico. He taught at the MTC, and he also served in the Army National Guard as a Spanish linguist. Now, in his 22nd year of employment in church education, Eric has been a full-time seminary teacher in Salt Lake City, a religion instructor at BYU Provo, an institute director and seminary coordinator in North Carolina, and has spent the last four years here at the BYU-Hawaii Religion Department. This is his dream job. He loves the students and is enjoying his opportunity to serve as a bishop of the Married Student First Ward. He genuinely enjoys the beauty, history, culture, and people of the islands. He loves living in Laie and feels very blessed to teach at BYU-Hawaii. I love to hear him teach. He loves the gospel, and his years of studying the doctrine through the scriptures and the words of our living prophets has greatly blessed our family. We have four children, three boys and a little girl, and we are so grateful to live here in this beautiful place, in this wonderful community, and be part of this great university. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you my husband, Eric Marlowe. Brothers and sisters, aloha. aloha. This year marks the 150th anniversary of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints purchase of this beautiful area of Laie as a gathering place for the island saints. As well, this year marks the 60th anniversary of the groundbreaking of the BYU-Hawaii campus. President Gordon B. Hinckley once said, when you walk across the soil of Laie on this campus or anywhere else in this community, Remember that this is the fruit of those who walked with faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The names given to several of our campus buildings, in the names given, we have memorialized a few of those people President Hinckley spoke of who walked with faith and helped produce this community and university, the fruit of which we are so blessed to partake. The Lord needs lives that add savor to those around them and give light that helps illuminate the path for others. Those whose names adorn our campus buildings offer us powerful examples of these kinds of people. Their names serve as daily reminders of the type of noble men and women that David O. McKay prophesied would go forth from this school and whose influence would be felt for good throughout the world. For this reason, I believe it is worth our time to acquaint ourselves with the lives of some of our building's namesakes. So let's take a virtual tour of our campus to meet and to learn from some of those whose names have been given to our buildings. Let's begin this tour where we are currently gathered, the George Q. Cannon Activity Center. George Quell Cannon was born January 11, 1827 in Liverpool, England. When George was 13, he and his family received the gospel and were baptized. The Cannon family determined to join with the saints in America, arriving in Nauvoo in 1843. Sadly, his mother died at sea during the journey. When George was 17, Joseph and Hiram Smith were martyred, and his uncle John Taylor was severely wounded at Carthage Jail. Compounding this tragedy, George's father died two months later. George trekked west with the saints, arriving in the Great Salt Lake Valley in October 1847. And three years later, while on a church assignment in California, George, then 24, was called to serve a mission in the Sandwich Islands 
today known as the Hawaiian Islands. The youngest in a group of 10 missionaries called to serve in Hawaii, Elder Cannon and his fellow companions arrived in Honolulu December 12, 1850. Of their arrival, Cannon records, our first duty after securing lodging was to go to a convenient mountain. On the way up, each picked up a rock with which we formed a rude altar. We then sang a hymn and each one in his turn expressed his desires. Hiram Clark, who was also the president, was selected to be mouth in prayer. He asked that the Lord would make speedy work of those islands, open an effectual door to the preaching of the gospel, help us gather out the honest in heart, and spare our lives to return home in safety. The Spirit of the Lord rested powerfully upon us, and we were filled with exceeding great joy." Close quote. On this mission, young Elder Cannon faced many challenges that we can relate to. Fear of public speaking, feelings of inadequacy, struggles with learning a foreign language, strange food and customs, and homesickness. Yet what is remarkable is how he turned to the Lord for help and received it. For example, Elder Cannon recorded, I constantly suffered from this feeling of fear whenever I attempted to speak publicly, and this continued into my mission. However, I resolved that whenever called upon, I would, with the help of the Lord, always pray or speak and not try to excuse myself. I shall not attempt to describe to you the gladness that I as a young missionary felt. I had been a slave, but now I was free. God had broken the bands of my fear, and I felt to glorify Him for His goodness. From that day to this, I have never suffered from those dreadful, feel those dreadful feelings which oppressed me." Close quote. Young Elder Cannon's willingness to put forth his part, combined with his faith in the Lord, produced powerful results. Regarding his effort to learn the Hawaiian language, Cannon wrote, My desire to learn to speak was very strong, and I never permitted an opportunity of talking with the natives to pass without improving it. I also tried to exercise faith before the Lord to obtain the gift of talking and understanding the language. One evening, while sitting on the mats visiting with some neighbors, I felt an uncommonly great desire to understand what they said. All at once, I felt a peculiar sensation in my ears. I jumped to my feet, and with the hands at the side of my head, I exclaimed to the elders who sat at the table, I believed I had received the gift of interpretation. And it was so. From that time forward, I had but little, if any, difficulty in understanding what the people said. This was a great aid to me, and I felt very thankful for this gift from the Lord." Close quote. Elder Cannon even sought the Lord's help with the food. He recounted, I had tasted a teaspoon of poi, but the smell of it was so much like that of a bookbinder's sour paste pot that when I put it to my mouth, I gagged at it. However, in traveling among the people, I soon learned that if I did not eat poi, I would put them at great inconvenience, for they would have to cook separate food for me every meal. This would make me burdensome to them and might interfere with my success. I therefore determined to learn to live on their food, and that I might do so, I asked the Lord to make it sweet to me. My prayer was heard and answered. The next time I tasted it, I ate a bowlful, and I positively liked it. It was my food, whenever I could get it from that time forward, as long as I remained on the islands." Close quote. Early in his mission, uh, Cannon was also faced with a challenging decision. There was difference among, of opinion among the elders that were uh, about whether or not they were to teach the native Hawaiians and how long they were to serve. The mission president left each missionary to, de to determine this for himself. Cannon recorded, our only resource was to obtain revelation from the Lord. Of this experience, he wrote, For my part, I felt it to be clearly my duty to warn all men. If I had to do it alone, I felt that I could not do otherwise and be free from condemnation, for the spirit of it was upon me. Of the original ten missionaries, Elder Cannon and four others chose to remain, learn the language, and teach the native Hawaiians. These five pioneering elders established patterns that would be followed by waves of missionaries, of future missionaries, and their decision to teach the natives the gospel and include them in the work led to thousands of conversions. Another part of Elder George Q. Cannon's legacy includes the Book of Mormon. As a young missionary in Hawaii, Cannon drew great strength from its pages. After recalling multiple hardships, he explained, it was then that I found the value of the Book of Mormon. I felt inclined, if I felt inclined to be lonely, to be low-spirited or homesick, 
I had only to turn to its sacred pages to receive consolation, new strength, and a rich outpouring of the Spirit. Scarcely a page did not contain encouragement. What were my petty difficulties compared with those afflictions which the sons of King Mosiah had to endure? If they could relinquish their high estate and go forth among the Lamanites, should not I labor with patience and devoted zeal for the salvation of these people, heirs to the same promise? No man can read this book, partake of its spirit, and obey its teachings without being filled with a deep love for the souls of men and a burning zeal to do all in his power to save them." Close quote. Elder's Canon, Elder Cannon's desire for others to experience the power of the Book of Mormon as he had, combined with his understanding that the native Hawaiians were Lehi's posterity, and the Hawaiians' eagerness to know more about the stories they had been taught from its pages, all compelled him, with the help of others, to translate the Book of Mormon into Hawaiian. Though young Elder Cannon faced many challenges and setbacks during his nearly four years as a missionary in Hawaii, he later said, I had never been so happy in my life as I was then. I could go unto God in faith. He listened to my prayers. He gave me great comfort and joy. He revealed himself to me as he had never done before. A friendship was there established between our Father in heaven and myself, which I trust will never be broken nor diminished." Close quote. When we pass by the George Q. Cannon Activity Center, perhaps we will remember that we too can call upon the Lord for help and receive it, that personal revelation is the privilege of every man and woman, and that there is real power in the Book of Mormon. Next, on our virtual tour, let's go to the Jonathan H. Napella Center for Hawaiian and Pacific Island Studies. Jonathan Hawaii Napella is considered by many to be the most influential Hawaiian convert to the church. Descending from royal lineage known to Hawaiians as the Ali'i, he was born in September 1813 on the island of Maui. He began his formal education at age 18 in a Protestant school near Lahaina. And from this schooling, Napella went on to practice law and later served as district judge in Wailuku. In 1851, Napella was introduced to the church by Elder George Q. Cannon who wrote that the moment I entered into the house of this native, I felt convinced that I had met the men for whom I had been looking for to help with the work. Shortly thereafter, Napella accepted Cannon's offer to teach him English if he would in turn teach Elder Cannon Hawaiian, and he invited Elder Cannon to stay with him. Elder Cannon recorded that during this time, Napella was threatened with removal from his judgeship and with being cut off from associations but he manifest no disposition to have me leave. Along with learning each other's language, Elder Cannon taught Napella the restored gospel, and 10 months later, following careful investigation, Napella was baptized by Elder Cannon in January 1852. Napella often showed Elder Cannon and other Utah missionaries a greater dimension of faith. Apparently, after Elder Cannon and others had prayed for good weather, for a church conference to be held the next day, they determined that the weather would be unpleasant and decided to hold the meeting indoors. Napella and a few others asked why they planned to hold the meeting indoors after praying to the Lord to bless the weather. Napella was surprised at the lack of faith, and Cannon and his American missionaries, missionary companions felt rebuked. As a result, the meeting was held outdoors in a nearby grove. On another occasion, when a group of missionaries encountered problems crossing the channel between the islands of Lanai and Maui, Napella's faith was evident. Elder Benjamin Johnson recounted the events as follows. The choppy and sultry calm was a terrible ordeal, and all became seasick. And like some others, I became unconscious. When aroused from stupor, I heard Brother Cannon tell Brother Napella to pray. He stood up in the bow, and in his native tongue and simple faith, asked the Lord to have mercy upon his servants and send the wind quickly. I knew the wind would come, and it did, in less, than, less time than I take to write it, and we soon gladly landed at Lahaina." Close quote. From the time of his conversion, Napello was dedicated to building Zion in the Hawaiian Islands. He was a powerful missionary, instrumental in bringing hundreds of his fellow Hawaiians to the restored gospel. He taught the Utah missionaries the Hawaiian language. He fed them and allowed them to lodge in his home. Napilla even gave teenage missionary Joseph F. Smith the shoes from his own feet. Elder John Woodbury wrote, Brother Napilla is a noble-hearted man and has done more in assisting the elders than any other. 
What's more, Napella was extremely helpful in the translation of the Book of Mormon. Of this experience, Elder Cannon wrote, wrote, probably but few in the Hawaiian nation were as well qualified as Brother Napella to help me in the translation. He was a descendant from the old chiefs of the island of Maui and whose families the language was preserved and spoken in the greatest purity. And he had advantages which no other equally well-educated man possessed. He had studied the principles of the gospel very thoroughly. He had a comprehensive mind to grasp the truth and he had been greatly favored by the spirit." Close quote. Nepella visited Utah in the summer of 1869 likely becoming the first Hawaiian Latter-day Saint to enter Salt Lake City. While in Salt Lake City, Napella became the first known Hawaiian to receive his temple endowment. Sharing his temple experience likely caused other Hawaiian saints to travel to Utah so they could also receive the blessings of the temple. Napella even taught King Kamehameha V about the vicarious ordinance of baptism for the dead. In a letter to President Brigham Young, Napella said, I informed my king that I was baptized on behalf of King Kamehameha I, but that he is responsible for the remainder of his ancestors and that their salvation rests upon him. There was much astonishment before me and appreciation." Close quote. Napella was an ambassador for the temple among the early Hawaiian saints. At the October 1871 conference held in Laie, Napella and 13 other Hawaiian brethren were called as missionaries. Napella was appointed to oversee these men who were to visit all the Hawaiian islands. However, a few months later, Napella grieved when doctors discovered that his wife Kitty had contracted Hansen's disease or leprosy. Kitty was quarantined in a leper colony on the island of Molokai. Rather than abandon his wife, Napella chose to remain with her. In a letter to the Board of Health, Napella pleaded, I humbly petitioned the board to permit me to stay here with my wife for the following reasons. On August 3, 1843, I took her as my legally married wife, and on that same day, I vowed before God to care for my wife in health and sickness and until death do us part. I am 60 years old, and during the brief time remaining, I want to be with my wife. Such is the reason for this petition. Napella's appeal was granted and he spent most of the remaining, his remaining days at the leprosy settlement and was assigned by church leaders to oversee the two church branches in that area. Jonathan H. Napella later contracted leprosy and died on August 6, 1879, and his wife Kitty passed away less than two weeks later. When you pass the Jonathan H. Napella Center, perhaps you will remember simple yet powerful faith, a commitment to building God's kingdom in your own land, an ambassador of the temple, a loving and deeply committed husband. Now, let's go to the Joseph F. Smith Library. Joseph Fielding Smith was born November 13, 1838 in Far West Missouri. He was only five years old when his father Hiram Smith was martyred along with his uncle, the prophet Joseph Smith at Carthage Jail. Tragically, his mother died in 1852 leaving him an orphan at age 13. Of the time period following his mother's death, Joseph F. Smith later wrote that he had been like a comet or a fiery meteor without gravitation to keep him balanced or guide him within reasonable bounds. It was during this volatile time in his life that it was announced in the April 1854 General Conference that he was called at age 15 to take a mission to the Hawaiian Islands. This would be the first of three separate missions he would serve in Hawaii during his lifetime. This call at age 15 seemed to miraculously channel the fiery grit of his youth towards service in the kingdom. Within his first few days in Hawaii, his mission president, Francis A. Hammond, recorded, he is not yet 16 years old, but bids fame to make a mighty man in this kingdom. Although his formal education had been meager, during his first mission, Joseph F. developed into an avid learner. He seemed to read constantly. Not only did he study religion, but Joseph F. read voraciously in history, philosophy, poetry, the classics, current events, virtually anything he could acquire. Numerous pages of his diaries were devoted to new vocabulary words, verb conjugations, inspirational poetry, and handwriting practice. 
Additionally, he meticulously cataloged the natural wonders, curiosities, and historical events, such as the 1856 eruption of Mauna Loa and news of various disasters at sea. Our library seems fittingly named after a man with such passion for learning. Elder Smith developed a deep love for the Hawaiian members. Of his first mission, he later reflected, my four years mission to the Hawaiian Islands restored my equilibrium and fixed the laws and bounds which have governed my subsequent life. At age 25, Joseph F. was again called to serve a mission in Hawaii with Apostles Lorenzo Snow and Ezra Taft Benson and former missionaries William Clough and Alma Smith. The special purpose of this mission was to correct problems caused by Walter Murray Gibson, an apostate missionary who had led the church in Hawaii astray. Elder Smith acted as principal interpreter for the apostles, and after Gibson was excommunicated and the apostles departed, Joseph F. remained as mission president. President Heber J. Grant recounted an occurrence told by Elder Snow involving Joseph F. during this second mission to Hawaii. With their ship anchored off the island of Maui, Joseph F. refused to get into the small boat that would take them all to shore because he felt it was unsafe. To Apostle Lorenzo Snow, he said, If you, by the power and authority of the priesthood of God, tell me to get into that boat, I will do so. But unless you command me in the authority of the priesthood, I will not do so because it is not safe. The others laughed at the young man, Joseph F. Smith, but he said the boat will capsize. The others got into the boat, and it did capsize. Lorenzo Snow drowned on that occasion, but for the blessings of the Lord in resuscitating him, he would not have lived. It was revealed to Elder Snow, then and there, that the boy with the courage of his convictions, with the iron will to be laughed at and scorned, was as lacking courage to get into that boat, and who stayed on that vessel, would yet be the prophet of God." Close quote. Two years later, at age 27, Joseph F. Smith was called as an apostle. Years later, while serving as second counselor to President John Taylor, Joseph F. Smith, then age 46, went into voluntary exile during, uh, due to the practice of plural, plural marriage. During this time, he served a third mission to Hawaii. While there, a new branch uh, president uh, or branch presidency was organized in Laie. Enoch Farr was appointed president, and the record states that Farr chose Joseph F. Smith and Albert W. Davis as his counselors. Having the second counselor in the first presidency, an ordained apostle, willingly serve as the first counselor in a small branch presidency is a powerful reminder that serving in the kingdom matters more than position. Later as prophet, Joseph F. Smith visited Hawaii multiple times. On one such visit to Laie in June 1915, President Smith with traveling companions Bishop Nibley and Elder Smoot made their way up the small hill to the old Laie Chapel. There they had some conversation on the subject that a small temple be built in Laie. It was suggested that the temple be built on that very spot where the chapel stood. President Smith then stated, I feel impressed to dedicate this ground for the erection of a temple to God, for a place where the peoples of the Pacific Isles can come and do their temple work. If you think there would be no objection to, to it, I think now is the time to dedicate the ground. And he did so. President Smith's desire that the temple project progress brought him again to the temple site a year later. He was intimately involved in the construction details even to the point of ordering the correction of the colors used in a mural's water scene. Sadly, President Joseph F. Smith died a year before the temple's dedication. A periodical reported that during his three missions to the Hawaiian Islands, he became loved and reverenced by all. His honest, gentle, fearless, and sympathetic character drew the confidence, respect, and boundless love of this naturally trusting people." Close quote. The Laie Hawaii Temple is an impressive monument to the dedication and faith of the Hawaiian saints. Yet how fitting it was in the temple's 2010 rededicatory prayer that President Monson expressed gratitude, quote, for the insight and inspiration of President Joseph F. Smith, who served faithfully and tirelessly so that a house of the Lord could be built here, close quote. When entering the Joseph F. Smith Library, perhaps you will remember a hunger for learning 
courage to stand up for one's conviction. That willing service in the kingdom matters more than position and a love for a higher place of learning, the temple. Finally, let's visit the David O. McKay building. Born on September 8, 1873, David Oman McKay spent his youth in Huntsville, Utah. He served a mission to Great Britain and went on to marry his college sweetheart, Emma Ray Riggs. When he turned 32 years old, David O. McKay was ordained an apostle by President Joseph F. Smith. He served as assistant superintendent of, of church Sunday schools and later as church commissioner of education. In 1920, he was given the assignment to conduct a world tour of all church missions. And it was during this assignment with his traveling companion, Hugh Cannon, son of George Q. Cannon, that Elder McKay first visited Hawaii. During their stay in Hilo on the big island of Hawaii, they visited the Kilauea volcano at night. It is written that while Elder McKay and his company stood on the edge of the active volcanic crater, a cold wind swept down from the peak of Mauna Loa. Tiring of the cold, one of the elders discovered a volcanic ledge about four feet down inside the crater, where observers could watch the display without being chilled by the wind. It seemed perfectly sound, and the barrier on the open side of it formed a fine protection from the intense heat of the volcano. After first testing its safety, Elder McKay and three of the elders climbed down onto the hanging ledge. For quite some time, all watched the ever-changing sight. Suddenly, Elder McKay said to those with him, Brethren, I feel impressed that we should get out of here. With that, he assisted the elders to climb out. The moment they vacated the spot, the whole ledge crumbled and fell with a roar into the molten lava a hundred feet or so below. Nothing was said as the elders walked down the slope. They all knew they had been saved by inspiration from a fiery death." Close quote. Yet perhaps the most significant event during Elder McKay's tour of the Hawaiian Islands in 1921 was his visit to the Laie Plantation School. It was there, while witnessing a flag raising ceremony, that he envisioned the university we attend today. He recounted the following experience. One morning, President Hugh J. Cannon, others, and I witnessed a flag raising ceremony by students of the small church school here in Laie. In that little group of young students, were Hawaiians, Americans, Chinese, Japanese, Portuguese, and Filipinos. We listened to a representative from each of these groups pay tribute as the flag was raised and all vowed allegiance. That ceremony brought tears to my eyes, truly the melting pot. In this community, all the races met as one, members of the church, the restored church of Jesus Christ. What an example in this little place of the purpose of our Father in Heaven to unite all peoples by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And on that occasion, we visualize the possibility of making this place the center of education of the people of these islands." Close quote. This vision was realized 34 years later when David O. McKay, then prophet, presided over the groundbreaking of this university in a cleared sugarcane field near where the David O. McKay building now stands, he pronounced the great prophecies that directly relate to you and me. Particularly, he prophesied that from this school will go men and women whose influence will be felt for good towards the establishment of peace internationally. The Polynesian Cultural Center was also established under President McKay's direction in 1963. President McKay once said, the essence of true culture is consideration for others. And he vowed that visitors' experience at the Polynesian Cultural Center would influence their lives for good. When you pass by the David O. McKay building, you may recall the importance of following the promptings of the Spirit, a global vision of God's family and kingdom, the importance and value of education. As I review the lives of these men, I love how George Q. Cannon drew strength from the Lord. I wish I had the faith of Jonathan Lapella. I marvel at the fortitude and unwavering commitment of Joseph F. Smith. I desire the vision and the inclusiveness of David O. McKay. Yet as I have studied the lives of these men, it is clear to me that they were not perfect. They were not immune from tragedy and multiple setbacks, and each of them had insecurities and fears. 
but each showed a resilience to get up, to press forward, to continue to look outside themselves and serve. They drew strength from personal prayer and the scriptures. They sought the Lord's help and guidance and lived in such a way to receive it. They knew they were doing God's will, and they trusted their church leaders. They were not aloof, but engaged in the world around them. We can do the same. President Howard W. Hunter said, I am reasonably assured all of you want to achieve a measure of greatness in this life. Many of you want to be leaders in your chosen fields, corporate presidents, state, statesmen, musicians, or artists. We encourage you to achieve. Yet frequently, it is the commonplace tasks that have the greatest positive effect on the lives of others, and not what the world so often sees as greatness. I believe there is no such thing as instant greatness. This is because the achievement of true greatness is a long-term process. It may involve occasional setbacks. The end result may not always be clear, but it seems that it always requires regular, consistent, small, and sometimes ordinary and mundane steps over a long period of time. We should remember that it was the Lord who said, out of small things proceedeth that which is great. Close quote. Throughout your life, the positions you hold and the titles you receive may allow you valuable opportunities, but it is likely who you are, the message you share, and the light you shine that will offer the most profound and lasting influence. Like those who have gone before us, May we walk with faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and by so doing, be men and women whose influence can truly be felt for good towards the establishment of peace. May we so live is my prayer. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen.